This is a tutorial for urban computing. Make sure you are in the right room. Okay. Okay. So uh, as we know, the rapid progress of urbanization has modernized many people's lives, but also generated a lot of issues. Traffic congestion, energy consumption, and air pollution. Tackling these challenges seems nearly impossible years ago, given the complex setting of the city. But now the advances in sensing technology and large-scale computing infrastructure have generated a diversity of big data, from social media to traffic data, from meteorological data to geographic data. When used correctly, the data can help us tackle the challenges we are facing in cities. So motivated by this opportunity, we propose urban computing since 2008, which is comprised of four layers, from urban sensing to urban data management to data analytics and service providing. Then we connect four layers into a loop for a recurrent and obtrusive improvement on people's life, city operating system, and the environment. In short, we are going to use big data and AI technology to solve big challenges in big cities. In the coming three hours, we, I will go through the concepts, technology, and the representative applications on each layer of the framework. There is one survey paper about urban computing, uh, which was published at the TIST in 2015. So you can go read this paper for more details. Now let's start from urban sensing layer. That means how data was collected and how can we acquire data through using sensor or using human as a sensor. So there are two major modes for urban sensing. One is called sensor-centric sensing. Another one is called human-centric sensing. In the first category, uh, there are two subcategories uh, called static sensing and mobile sensing, which means we can deploy a sensor at a fixed location or on moving objects like bus or taxis. But if the sensor has been deployed, people are not involved in the sensing process the data will be automatically sent to a backend system. So people are not involved. This is the reason why we call sensor-centric in this mode. Another mode is called human-centric sensing. This is recently getting popular um, in urban computing. So basically, we can regard each individual as a sensor to prop the ambient situation. Later, we can pull the data from individuals to solve some big challenges collectively. There are two subcategories in this uh, mode. One is called passive cloud sensing. Another one is called active cloud sensing. In, in a passive cloud sensing mode, people have no idea they are contributing data. They have no idea what's the purpose for the data connection. And they, that they even don't know uh, when and where they have been participated in a data connection program. For example, when we make a phone call, the data a phone call can be used to improve the quality of service in wireless communication networks. But people have no idea the data has been connected and used for improved service. And when we swap in and swap out in a public transporting system, the car swapping data can be used to improve the public transporting system. But we have no idea we are contributing data. So this is called passive cloud sensing. In another sensing program, we call active cloud sensing, people have idea know exactly when and where they join a program, and then they know the purpose for contributing the data. And there even are some incentive to encourage people to contribute data. So this is called active cloud sensing. Recently, more uh, data uh, has been provided through this way. People are joining a program, they know the purpose for data collection, and then they can choose to opt in or opt out in a data collection program. So that's the four um, modes for data connection in urban sensing. And what's a challenge for urban sensing? I summarize them into four categories. The first one is called BIOS distribution. Um, typically, what we can collect in a city is a sample of data instead of the entire data set. The distribution um, of some property in the sample might be very different from the distribution on the entire data set. Let me give you one example. We can collect some 
uh, trajectory data, GPS trajectory data of test caps, which is only a portion of traffic of the entire city. The distribution of test cap on road segments may be very different from the distribution of the entire traffic. On some road segments, so we, we may observe many taxi cabs, but very few private cars. On the other hand, there may be some road segments with many, uh, test, uh, with many private cars, but very few taxi cabs. So we cannot simply estimate the traffic volume on road segment based on the observation of test cab. For example, we cannot simply multiply, multiply a factor to the number of test cabs we observe on road segment to estimate the number of vehicles traveling on the entire uh, city. <clears throat> so this is called bias distribution. The challenge is how we can derive true knowledge from the sample data and avoid the bias distribution. So that's the first challenge. The second one is called data sparsity. We have very limited sensor deployed in city, but we try to monitor the city uh, as fine green as possible. For example, we only have a 35 air quality monitoring station deployed in Beijing, but we're trying to monitor the air quality of every one kilometer square kilometer uh, region. So how to derive the fine grid information based on very limited and sparse sensor data? So this is called data sparsity. And we have paper uh, on uh, through the link, you can go through the paper for more details. I just give you some brief first, and we can go into details later. Um, another challenge is called data missing. Data missing is different from data sparsity. Data sparsity means we have very limited sensors generating sparse data. But even if a sensor has been deployed, we may not receive data because of some um, communication error or device error, and this will lead to data missing. So in this figure, uh, there are six of the five sensors uh, supposing to generate a reading every hour, but because of some reason, for example, the error, sensor error or communication error, we may lost some reading at some moment in some sensors. So this is called data missing, which is different from data sparsity. Okay. The fourth challenge is called resource deployment. We have very limited budget, we have very limited labor resource or land to deploy sensors, but we try to achieve more, achieve more. Um, the reason why this uh, resource deployment is challenging lies in two folds. The first one is, typically we have not our candidate to select. So how to choose the best candidate is usually a big hard problem. Uh, let me give you one example. Um, we try to deploy charging station for electrical vehicles in a city but there are not a road intersection in the city. If we are going to choose uh, five charging station, where should we choose the five intersection out of maybe tens of thousands intersections? This is a big hard problem. And second reason is the uh, measurement of, of the collect data is, is really usually very hard to define. Sometimes we don't have ground choose. We don't even know which is good, which is not good. Let me give you one example. Uh, supposing we, are, we have budget to deploy four additional uh, air quality monitoring stations in the city. Where should we deploy them so that we can maximize the monitoring effect of air quality in the entire city? This is very challenging because before we deploy a sensor, we don't really know the air quality of that, of that location. Then we don't know how to measure which is good or not, if the sensor should be deployed or not. So this is a challenge problem. Uh, I summarized the challenge into four categories, and there are two modes, four categories of challenges. Then I give you some uh, concrete example. The first example is more application oriented, uh, which is uh, very simple. So this is a medical emergency service, uh, which are available in many cities around the world. So the, typic the typical um, routine of this system is a patient may call a dispatch center through 911 or 120 in China. Um, then the dispatch center will send an ambulance to pick up the passenger from an ambulance station that could be close to the patient. Then the ambulance will send the patient to a hospital 
and then return to an uh, ambulance station. So this is a typically process how medical emergency service works. Um, now the problem is how should we deploy the ambulance station so that we can minimize the pickup time of passengers of the entire city. The right bottom, um, the top right figure shows the distribution of ambulance station in Tianjin, which is a major city in China. Each triangle, which yellow triangle stands for one ambulance station. Typically, the ambulance station are not deployed in in hospital because some reasons because the hospital and the ambulance station may be operated by two different company and there is a hard requirement we to need to meet. For example, when there is a uh, emergency request or arrivals, we need to answer the request. I mean, we, can, we need to reach the request in a given time interval. But if all the ambulance station are associated with hospital, it's impossible to dispatch a uh, ambulance to pick up a passenger in a given time. So that's the reason why ambulance station is different from hospital. But how to deploy this ambulance station is very uh, was a challenging topic. Typically, uh, in, in some of our traditional deployment uh, strategies, they only consider some static information. For example, the population in a given area. And um, the number of intersections or the number of POIs in a given area. But this is not right. As we know, the number of medical emergency services does not only depend on the population, but also depends on uh, the requirement of people or the health condition of people. What if there's a place uh, with very few population, but with very bad health condition, they may have a higher requirement than other places with higher population. So now we have real uh, medical emergency service call from people. We know where and when people make a phone call to request a medical emergency service. And we know how a, a, an ambulance dispatched to pick up each passenger, uh, uh, patient. Now, based on the data, based on the um, request data, based on the uh, dispatching trajectory, we can reallocate I mean, we can redeploy the ambulance stations at a different location so that the pickup time of passenger of patients can be minimized. So based on the AI technology, we can uh, reduce the pickup time by 30%. Per that means uh, if we need to spend 100 hours to pick up 100 patient patients previously, now we can only spend 70 hours to pick up 100 patients. Then the 30 hours can be saved for saving the patient's life uh, in hospital. So this is uh, mission critical. And the second step, uh, even if an ambulance station has been deployed, the number of ambulances that should be deployed in each station uh, is dynamic instead of static. Uh, at some moment, for example, in the morning, in some area, there are not a request. But in the evening, during the evening, there are few requests. So we should dynamically allocate the ambulers through different stations. And then this will further uh, enhance the capacity of the entire system. So we have uh, two pieces of research on this topic. But i just give you one brief idea. So this is about uh, urban sensing. You can regard it as a, a resource deployment problem. Given, in not, given limited budget, we don't increase any budget, we don't increase any resource. We just redeploy the station. Then we can maximize the capacity of the medical emergency service uh, system. And then we can save more people's life. You can read the paper for more details. Now, in the second example, I will give them uh, more details about algorithm and concrete uh, technologies. Data missing, as I mentioned, is a very challenging problem in urban sensing. We may um, have not of sensor data generated by a diversity of sensor, but we usually find such, such kind of uh, uh, problem, which is called data missing. The data uh, which is supposed to generate it, but finally get lost because of the communication error or uh, uh, sensor error. So this is a reality. We have five sensors um, which are supposed to generate a, 
reading at each timestamp, but because of some reason, we may have lost some readings, uh, which are uh, represented by the white circles. And the green circle means the reading we have received. So this is a very common of, of phenomenon in many data we have. So the first step is how to fill the missing value in the data we have, so that we can better monitor the entire system or for later data analytics. So this is a problem we, we define. How we do fill it? Uh, we fill the missing value based on its own data. That means the data of a sensor in past or uh, next hours, and also the data from its neighborhoods. So it's a uh, collect information we use, not only based on data uh, from the sensor, but also data from its neighborhood. So there are um, a lot of information we can use. So this is uh, what we are going to do. Then we fill them step by step until all the missing values have been filled. So this is a goal of our research. Uh, what's the challenge of the problem? So there are two aspects of challenge. The first one, we don't really know where and when the sensor will lost data. So the missing value is, uh, the location of missing value is random. We don't really know where uh, missing value uh, will occur. So this will fail some machine learning model that require a fixed input because we don't know um, which sensor will lost data. So we don't really know which sensor can be used as input. So this will fail many machine, machine learning models that are trying to use um, fixed input. And also, we cannot use some uh, simple linear interpolation algorithm to fill the missing value because in some situation, um, oh, in some situation, the missing value are not really uh, linearly dependent. Let me give you one example. So there are three sensors here, S1, S2, S3. Um, according to a distance, uh, S1 is close to, closer to S2 than S3. This is S2, this is S3. So this short, the distance is shorter, but this is larger. So according to the uh, first law of geography, if we use some linear interpolation, uh, a shorter distance may indicate a, a higher similarity of their radius. But in reality, it's not true here, uh, because S2 is located, S1, sorry, S1 is located in a forest, while S2 is located in a commercial area. So S3, with a farther distance, but located in a similar commercial area, have, has a similar air quality as S2. So this will um, fill some uh, linear interpolation, interpolation algorithm. And also, uh, on the temporal dimension, we can see uh, this, uh, this is a reading of the three sensors. When there are some, um, situ in some situation, for example, there are uh, uh, heavy string, uh, uh, strong wind comes or uh, rainstorm comes, the air quality of one location will drop tremendously in a few hours, for example, in one hour. So this makes uh, the reading of next hour very dissimilar than this one. Um, so that means we cannot just choose the temporally adjacent reading of this sensor to interpolate uh, the reading of the missing value. And also we cannot simply pick out its nearest neighbor to interpolate it's missing value. So this is a true challenge of the, of the problem. So random missing, we don't know where a missing occurs. And even in some time, at some moment, we may lose reading of all sensors. For example, the, the power issue or communication error, we may lose sensor of the entire uh, sensor set. Or we may lost information in one sensor over a long period of time. This is the first challenge. The second challenge is uh, we cannot use some linear interpolation algorithm to do the missing value theory because in most, in many situations, they are not linearly dependent. Now, how can we do that? We can solve this problem from two different perspectives. The one is a spatial temporal perspective. Another one is called global temporal perspective. So if we place this five sensor data in the matrix, well, each row stands for one sensor and each column stands for one timestamp. 
and each entry stands for the reading of the sensor at this time stamp. The goer is trying to fill the missing value in this matrix. This is our problem, okay? So at the first perspective, we can look at, the, the, look at them from a spatial and temporal perspective. That means we can fill the missing value of this place based on its spatial neighborhood. That means we can use the reading from other lines, other rules, to fill the missing value of this rule. Or alternatively, we can fill the missing value of this place based on its temporal neighborhood. I mean, based on its own reading in past or next few hour, hours. So this is called a temporal view, which means we can fill the missing value of this one based on reading of other columns. So this is called a spatial temporal perspective. Another perspective is we can use data of recently, uh, recent hours. For example, we can use the data of recent, recent day, of today. And also we can use the data um, over a very long period. This is called global. So we can use some empirical rules learned from a very long period of time. Or alternatively, we can use the data or, that has been generated in the past few hours. So this is called local and global, spatial and temporal. Okay. So what's a global view? Um, what's the empirical knowledge you can learn from a from data over a long period of time. So there are two basic rules that, typically, that are typically used in um, geographic information system. For example, uh, in terms of the uh, first law of geography, everything is related, but near things are more related than distancing. So in most cases, we can use uh, inverse distance weighting algorithm, uh, which looks like this equation to interpolate the value of one location based on two existing or more existing values. Uh, for example, uh, the horizontal axis denotes the distance between two locations, and the vertical denotes the similarity between their radius. As the distance increases, the similarity of the reading between the two locations decreases, almost linearly. So we can find such phenomena in many, many uh, geospatial data. So in most cases, it's right. So we can use such kind of uh, uh, inverse distance weighting algorithm to do interpolation. From a temporal perspective, uh, we know as the time interval between two timestamps time stamps increase, the similarity between the two timestamps decrease almost following uh, exponential, uh, exponential, uh, exponential distribution. Then we can use such kind of algorithm like a uh, uh, simple exponential smoothing to do interpolation. So this is called a global uh, empirical knowledge we can learn from uh, data, the data over a long period. But as I just mentioned, they are not always true. At the same moment, Locations with a shorter distance might have a very different reading of air quality because of their context. And in some situation, the air quality may drop very quickly because of the downpour or strong wind comes. Um, so we should focus on recent data. This is called a local view. So we can only choose the data of recent hours to formulate the sub matrix. Then we can fill the missing value based on, only based on the data of recent time. This is to try to avoid um, the bias dominated by the empirical setting we learned from a long period of time. Uh, here we can regard a sensor as a user and an item and, and the timestamps as an item. Now we can use collaborative collaborative filtering algorithm to fill the missing value. So if you know the recommendation system, um, CF model, collaborative filtering model, has been widely used to fill the missing value, uh, the infer user's interest. Now we can use the CF model to infer the missing value in this local matrix. Uh, we can use a sensor, uh, we can use a, a user-based CF model or item-based CF model to fill the missing value. Now we have four views. In terms of a spatial temple, there are two views. In terms of a global and local, there are two views. So there are two by two, four views. We can go through them, each of them. 
So IDW, we can regard the IDW as a global view and the spatial view. So it's global spatial view. And the SES, simple exponential smoothing, can be regarded as a global temporal view. And the user-based collaborative filtering can be regarded as a, a spatial view and the local view, local spatial view. And the U, UCF, it means um, ICF, item-based CF model can be regarded as a local view with a temporal view. So you can see this one is global, this one is spatial, and the solid circle means temporal view, and the dotted circle means spatial view. Now we have four view um, represented by four components. Each of them will generate one prediction for the missing value. So we have four predictions generated by four models. Now we perform a multi-view learning. We learn the parameter based on data. To fuse them, then we can get a more accurate result on the prediction. Um, so this is uh, how the system works. We have four, four views, or four models, two different perspectives. Then we predict them with each individual component and the merge the component, uh, resolve component based on the dynamic, um, based on the um, multi-view learning program. So the parameter of the omega uh, are learned dynamically based on data instead of a fixed. Now let's see the results. We have compared our results with many baselines. So this is a baseline we compared. For example, what if we only can consider a global view? or global sleep, spatial view, global temporal view, or spatial view plus temporal view, or only consider the local view. So we have almost compared our method with all the methods that can be used to solve this problem. Now it results in the best performance. Here is our method. We call spatial temporal multi-view learn STMVL. So this is a very, very fundamental plus three issues. The first one is the data, spatial temporal data which is different from text, video, or images. And second, we need to understand the platform, uh, which is kind of enhanced cloud computing platform. It's not simple cloud computing platform. The third one is the indexing and the retrieval algorithm we need to employ to deal with the spatial temporal data. So let's first take a look at the data we have in the city. There are uh, tens of thousands of data that have been generated in city every day. But in terms of their data structures, there are only two types of data. One is called point uh, data, another one is called network data. Uh, so indicated by the two rows. And also, in terms of the spatial temporal, the dynamics of the spatial temporal properties associated with each type of data, we can divide them into three columns. One is a spatial temporal uh, static. Another one is a spatial static, the temporal dynamic. The third one is a spatial temporal dynamic. I will give you some example on each category of data. For example, the point of interest data, which can be a restaurant, a university, or a bus station, is uh, is a point location with a static with a fixed location, which does not change over time and some fixed property, like the size of the room is fixed, or the number of windows in this room is fixed. So we call it spatial temporal static point data. But for some IoT data, for example, once we deploy a sensor at a fixed location, the location does not change over time, but the reading from the sensor changes over time every hour. So it's called spatial static, but temporal dynamic, and point data. And we also have some spatial temporal dynamic point data. Uh, the majority of cloud sensing data belongs to this category. Or we have some uh, Uber request. For example, if you're going to take a Uber or DD in China, you can issue a query at some location at some time interval. So this is a dynamic spatial temporal data. Uh, the location change over time and the time change over time. Regarding the network-based data, we all know real network is type of a graph data, but it's fixed. Once a location has been, once a, uh, a new network has been built, its location does not change over time because it's fixed. So it's called uh, spatial temporal static data, graph data. But if we overlap the traffic onto the new network, then 
we, we see spatially static but temporally dynamic traffic on you know, different road segments. The trajectory data is the most uh, sophisticated data uh, with a dynamic location and dynamic temporal reading. For example, when we're driving, we are driving, the location of the driver uh, keeps on changing over time, and the reading at each location um, are, dyna are dynamic. For example, the number of passengers in cars or the gas consumption at different locations. So they are different. But what's the difference between the two categories? Uh, for trajectory data, um, there's an order between two consecutive points generated by the same moving object. So there is a, so this is called network-based data structure. But for uh, the spatial temporal dynamic data in the point space, there's no connection between any two points. There are scatters. So that's the difference. The reason why we de define the data model, um, because we, we don't want to build hundreds of model for hundreds types of data because they have some similar property. Once we define the data model, we can accommodate any type of data with one out of the six models. Then in the system, we can define specific data management and the data mining algorithm for each type of data model. So once a new data comes, we can find the data model to fit the um, new data, and then we can use reuse the data management and the data mining algorithm in, in the platform. So this will make, make our system um, scalable. Okay, um, in the sixth type of data model, trajectory data is the most complicated and the most informative data because the location changes over time and the reading changes over time. And there's also a connection between each two consecutive points. So here is a tutorial for trajectory data mining because the majority of, uh, there are many types of data in cities can be represented by trajectory data. Um, for example, the trajectory of vehicles, people's movement, or even uh, birds fly over, over space, or cell phone data, uh, or trajectory of Uber, and a lot of trajectory data generated every day in cities. So then if we know how to mine the data, then we can enable a lot of uh, valuable applications. So there is a free tutorial. Uh, we have published the slides on my homepage. Uh, and also there's a survey paper on trajectory data mining at JSM transaction on intelligent system and technologies. So it starts from trajectory pre-processing, like map matching, trajectory compression, state point detection from trajectory and the noise filtering on trajectory segmentation. And then we have some trajectory management algorithm, for example, uh, moving object database or trajectory data management algorithms and we have some distance measurement for trajectories. Then we have some mining algorithm for uh, preserving the privacy of a trajectory or reduce uncertainty in a trajectory. Or we can mine some patterns from trajectory data like moving together pattern or frequent sequential pattern or periodic pattern in trajectory data. Now also we can do trajectory classification or trajectory, trajectory anomaly detection. And also we can turn trajectory into some other data formats like matrix or graph or tensor. Then we can apply some uh, tensor decomposition or matrix factorization algorithm onto the trajectory data. Now we have more techniques to mine trajectory data. Okay, oh, this is data where I, um, I would like to mention spatial temporal data, which is different from text, which is different from video speech. This will result in different data management and data mining algorithm in later presentation. And also trajectory data is the most um, sophisticated data and the most informative data. If we can learn how to mine this type of data, we can deal with other type of data easily. Um, this tutorial uh, is online, okay? The second piece of information I want to mention is uh, the platform about data management. Um, on one hand, on, the, on, on one side, we have a diversity of a variety of big data generated every hour. The scale is huge and the speed is very fast and they have different formats. On the other hand, we have a city scale application to enable. For example, we are going to predict traffic throughout the entire city. So the scale is a city wide, which requires 
more computational resource. So a natural thinking is uh, we need to use a platform to bridge the gap between the data we have and the applications we are going to enable. The most idea or, or the most intuitive idea is trying to use a, a cloud computing platform to bridge the gap between the two sides. However, current cloud computing platforms cannot support spatial temporal data very well because of following three reasons. The first one is the data structure of spatial temporal data is different from text, from image. Let me give you one example. So once the photo was taken, its size is fixed. But the size of a trajectory data keeps on increasing as a vehicles uh, traverse in a city. We don't know the size of the trajectory at once. And we cannot even switch the two points from one single trajectory. The switch will bring a totally different meaning of the movement. So the first reason is data structure is different. The second reason is the query is different. When we query um, text or query on other documents, we usually issue a keywords. And then we retrieve the documents containing the keywords, or approximately containing the keywords, based on some keywords matching or approximate matching algorithm. But now in spatial temporal data, in urban computing, um, we usually need to answer, answer some spatial temporal queries. Uh, for example, search for the vacant taxi around me in the past one minute. The past one minute. This is the spatial range around me plus the temporal range one past minute. The query is very different. So another typical query in urban computing is search for the nearest gas station around me where I was driving. The searching location is, keep, is, is moving and we're trying to do nearest, key nearest neighbor search. Such type of queries are not well supported by uh, any existing um, cloud computing platforms. The third reason is if we are going to do urban computing, we need to harness a diversity of data sets instead of a single data set. If you are trying to use multiple data sets, if you are trying to fuse the knowledge from multiple data sets, you need to manage them organically at one, at once. So this calls for some hybrid index structure that we can manage data across different domains. If we don't have such kind of technology, then if you are trying to correlate some data sets, it's very time consuming and it is too late when you are trying to enable some online applications. So let's take a look at some of uh, the platform we have built based on Microsoft Azure. Uh, Microsoft Azure is a kind of a cloud computing platform. We first, we de design six data models according to its data structure and the spatial temporal properties I just mentioned. So no matter what kind of data you can imagine in the city, we can accommodate them with one out of the data, or one out of the model. Then for different type of models, we can design uh, specific data management and machine learning algorithm for them. So this will make our system very useful and scalable. Um, the second layer is uh, the storage layer on Azure. Uh, we don't build anything here, we just leverage the exist existing resource from Azure, like SQL Server, Azure Table, Azure Blob. But on top of that, we need to design some special temple indexing structure for different type of uh, uh, data model. And also we need to design hybrid indexing structure to manage data across different uh, data models. And then we integrate the special temple indexing structure and hybrid indexing structure into Spark, Hadoop, and, and the Storm, which are uh, an imperial distributed computing environment in cloud computing platform. And then we can provide upper layer machine learning algorithm with some APIs so that the upper layer machine learning algorithm can access the large scale data sets uh, through the data management layer. So we have uh, two examples to, to show this uh, capability. Uh, the first example, we're trying to deploy a charging station in a city based on the number of uh, uh, trajectory we can cover. Uh, this is a maximum key coverage problem. Another one is try to deploy, or uh, we try to plan 
bike lanes for bicycle riding in a city. So you can see how data management can, can be used to do data mining and how the system can improve the efficiency of the tasks. In the first task, we are trying to deploy, let's say, five charging stations for electrical vehicles in this given area. Based on the GPS trajectory generated by test cap in the past one year. So this is a typically a um, um, K maximal coverage problem over trajectory data, and which is very time consuming, even if we use some uh, greedy algorithm to find an um, approximate measure, because there are a lot of uh, switching updating process to deal with. But now with the uh, indexing algorithm and the platform, we can uh, process them in a few seconds. But previously, because there are a lot of uh, intersection to select, a lot of trajectory to process, it may cost a couple of hours. But why should we care about the efficiency? Uh, because you say this is the urban planning problem, why should we care about the efficiency? Because there are a lot of criteria to consider when we deploy a charging station. Uh, besides the traffic uh, volume, we also need to, con we need to also consider um, the other situation. For example, what if there's no vacant place to deploy, or free place to deploy a station? Or what if there's no shopping mall or restaurant to accommodate the people when people are charging their uh, electric vehicles? As we know, the charging period may be a couple of hours where people can go. If there's no such kind of facility, we cannot deploy a charging station in this place. Then we can remove such kind of places that are eligible, eligible, uh, ineligible for deployment. Then we keep the rest of the results and let the algorithm to regenerate another round of results. So this is a, actually a, a way to combine domain knowledge with data science. Typically, we have some domain experts who knows not about how to deploy charging station, but they don't know data science. And then we have another group of people who know data science, but we don't know domain knowledge. Um, there are some requirements in domain experts' minds, but they cannot specifically tell you what the criteria is because it's so complicated to tell. Or even they, ter they tell me the old criteria. We cannot consider all the criteria in our machine learning model. So the basic matter is we build a matter based on very simple criteria. For example, the number of uh, uh, vehicles that we can cover in the city. Then we can generate the first round of results based on the simple criteria. Then we present the results to domain experts. The domain experts can look at the results and refine the results based on their own domain knowledge. They can say, oh, this place is not, nah, it's not good. This, this place is okay. Then we remove this one and keep the rest of them and let it go again. Then through such kind of interaction, the knowledge will be the knowledge of the experts will be bring into the system and enable human machine learning instead of a typical machine learning. Now the new trend of machine learning becomes human machine learning instead of a hu machine learning. That means combine human bring people in the loop during a machine learning process and combine human knowledge with data science. So this is a way that we can combine domain knowledge with data science through a visual interactive data um, analytics. So if we are trying to uh, enable uh, efficient communication between domain experts and the system, the efficiency is very important. People have no patience to wait for a couple of hours until the algorithm can generate one round of results. I give you a feedback, you give me the results very quickly. So that's the reason why we need to this, we don't need make this algorithm very efficient. In order to make the interactive visual data analytics possible, the efficiency is very important. Now there are, there are two publications about these papers. Uh, you can see more details on how spirit tempo algorithm and the platform can help improve the efficiency of the data mining problem. And this is a very typical uh, location selection model. You can imagine, uh, we can use this model for deploying uh, beer boards. For example, we, ha we have only very limited budget to build five additional beer boards in the city. Where should we put them so that we can maximize um, the advertisement effect of the, of, the, of the five beer boards? That means we can 
maximize the number of people who can see these billboards based on their movement trajectory. So this is a sim similar topic that can be, uh, that can be applied to. Okay, um, another example is we're trying to plan bike lanes based on uh, bike sharing trajectories. So you, you probably know China is a big country uh, based on bike years ago, many years ago. But that's what yeah, many years ago. We can see China used to be a country based on bike, but since 2000, 2000 very few people riding bike, more people tend to driving. Um, but in recent year, in past one year, there's a new thing happened. The right back sharing system um, has become proliferate uh, in China. You can see the not of a stationless back sharing system. People can pick up a bike at anywhere and drop a bike at anywhere. So this is a very convenient back sharing system. But um, prolifer the proliferation of the back system, back sharing system also depends on the riding experience of people. So if there is a well-defined or well-planned bike <coughs> lens, people can ride bike very safely and user-friendly. But what if there's no back lane planned? People have to risk their life riding a bike in the center of a road segment. It's very dangerous. And so as I just said, um, the bike lane was planned for the bike demand of China years ago. But now the new riding uh, bike sharing uh, system have bring a tremendous new requirement for bike riding. So the current bike lane cannot well support the huge traffic and huge demand on riding bikes. So how to construct, how to plan bike lanes more effectively? This is a very challenging problem because of the following three reasons. The first one is we have a very limited budget in terms of money and in terms of space. We cannot deploy a bike lane everywhere uh, because we have very limited money. And also once a bike lane is deployed, a vehicle, vehicle lane lost. So we have to make a balance. The second reason is we try to bring each individual rider uh, the better, uh, as better experience as possible. But we try to serve more people. There's a trade-off between the number of people we can serve and the riding experience that we can provide for each individual driver. There's a, because there are conflicts. Very simple idea, a very simple example is if we, we can, we just serve one people, we can, one person, we can build a specific or dedicated bike lap path for individual rider from his home to his working place. But such, such kind of bike paths can only serve one person. But if we are trying to serve more people, we have to cover more uh, hotspots or frequently ridden bike lanes. But this will not provide each individual rider a better experience because they only cover maybe a partial of your parts. So this is a conflict. The third one, we hope the bike lanes can be locally connected. Even if we cannot expect all the bike lanes are connected in the entire city because we have a very limited budget. But at least we hope them they can connect it in some local regions. So if you only select the top frequent rhythm bike lanes, that looks like like this figure. It's it's totally broken. Such kind of design will bring very bad very bad riding experience for riders. When the people hope the bike lanes can be planned like this one, at least in this area I can have a very user-friendly riding experience. So based on the three requirements, requirement, it's an NPR problem. And then how we can solve this problem? Um, fortunately, the system brings us not only riding demand, but also trajectory data of riders. We know how people ride bicycles, through which lands, and where is their destination, where is their origin place. Now, based on the data, based on the data, 
we can better plan the back lens. So this is a, a trajectory data uh, provided by Mobike in China. Now this is the map of Shanghai. Based on such kind of a trajectory data, we know people's real request or requirement on riding a bike. So we can better plan them. How we can plan? Uh, there are two step approach. Um, first, we select the top 1,000 most frequently ridden road segments by uh, users in the bike sharing system. Then we hierarchically class them into key area. Uh, the key is defined by garments. For example, garments try to build back lens in file area, so the key equals to file in, in this example. Then in each cluster, we select the most frequently written row segments as a seat in each cluster. Then we greatly, greatly, uh, greatly expand the back lens from the seating segment in each cluster until the budget has been used out. What's the budget? The budget means the total lens of back lens that can be built by garment. For example, garment only have money for to build a 30 kilometer back lens. So the 30 kilometer is a budget constraint. So the problem setting is given the garment's budget constraint, for example, garment can build 30 kilometer back lens in five area. So 30 kilometer and five are parameters given by garments. Then we plan the back lens based on the data. Uh, so that the, back, the planned back lens can support the trajectory generated by users in back sharing system more effectively. So this is a two-step framework. One is clustering, and another one is grid expansion in each cluster. And why this framework? Uh, there are two reasons. The first reason is intuitively, um, people's ride usually starts from some hotspots like subway station. After people depart from uh, um, get off a subway, they ride a bike to reach their final destination. So people's ride intuitively starts from some hot spots and gradually expand from spots. So that's the reason why we do expansion and start from the hit spots. And the second reason, if we don't do clustering, all the um, backland plant will be <coughs> connected in one area. So this cannot satisfy government requirement to build backlands in five area. So that's the reason why we need to do cluster first, then do grid expansion. So let's take a look at the detail of the algorithm. Um, for the clustering, we first select top M, hardest row segment. Here, let's say 1,000 row segments uh, based on the trajectory data we have, we have generated. So here the M is much more larger than K. K is the number of area defined by garment. Then we gradually merge each pair of um, row segments based on their row network distance. And using some uh, hierarchical clustering algorithm, we can cluster them into five clusters like this. Now, now finally, we have five clusters generated. Now from each cluster, we select the most frequently written segments as a seeding uh, seating segment and gradually expand them according to some um, uh, object function. Okay, how this um, grid expansion works? We first we need to define some uh, uh, object, uh, score function to evaluate the design, the support of a design back lens for existing trajectory. So here we're the two figures. So for example, there's one trajectory uh, represented by the blue dotted line. If we plan the back lens as this way, that means two broken back lens. Uh, the total distance is also is, is two kilometer of the back lens. This one is not as good as this one. If we plan the two the scores defined for uh, current, to evaluate current back lens. Uh, now I'll give you one example. 
So supposing there are two trajectory generated by two users, and we start from E1 root segment. We gradually expand the root segment to find a better design of back lens. For example, we can expand, try E2, this one, and then we can calculate the score of the plan E1, E2. So the score was calculated according to this equation. Let's say uh, the current E1, E2, uh, we can support trajectory 1 for the two continuous through segments. So the score 1, or the score that this plan can be obtained from trajectory 1 is in this manner. And also this plan only covers this segment for trajectory 2. So the score for this part is calculate this one. So if we suppose the length of uh, E1 is one, 100 meter and E2 is also 100 meter, then the score is calculated this way. Then we sum up them. This is the final score if we expand E2. Then according to this great expansion, we can calculate other score of other situation. For example, what if we expand E3? What if we expand E4? And what if we expand E5? And finally, we find the uh, expansion with the maximum increase of score divided by the length of the root segments. So this is uh, how greedy expansion works. But based on the expansion, we can find the best uh, uh, or the nearest uh, uh, optimal solution for backland plan planning. So this is the results we ob uh, obtained in Shanghai. I can see there are many subway stations, but before we are uh, running our algorithm, our algorithm, we don't know there is a back uh, subway station there. That means we don't consider the uh, station location. But eventually we found they really start from a uh, subway station. Now let's take a look at this uh, example. In this example, there is a subway station here, there's a um, shopping mall here, and a lot of uh, residential area around this place. And the red line are road segments that we suggest to build back lanes. But originally, there are only two roads with back lanes. So when people are riding on the two roads, they get a very good riding experience and a very safe. But when people are riding on other road segments, for example, this one, you can see people are riding on pedestrian and are <laughs> street or even riding in the vehicular uh, street. So that's a problem. With our platform and industrial algorithm, we can generate the planning very efficiently. Uh, then people can get a better riding experience. The government can use very limited resource to serve more people. And the bike sharing company can increase their number of users. Uh, so there are a win-win situation we can create uh, through urban computing. Okay, I just give you two examples uh, for demonstrating the capability of the platform in data management and use data management algorithm for doing planning bikes or planning uh, charging station for electrical vehicles. Now let's go to the data analytics layer. Uh, there are four challenges on this layer. Uh, the first one is Do we have a COVID break? I think that we don't have COVID break. 10, 12? 10.30, okay. Let's keep on going. Now then. Yeah, there are four challenges. So this will be the main content of this tutorial. Uh, because it's a KDD conference, we, we hope we, to, we can learn some uh, machine learning algorithm besides of data management. Um, the first challenge of data analytics on this layer is um, how to adapt machine learning algorithm, which were originally designed for text and image data to spatial temporal data. I will show you the difference between spatial temporal data and the image data. The second challenge is typically in traditional data mining, we usually mine single type of data. Typically years ago, if we say association rule, it's a simple data mining on transaction data in supermarket. But now, in urban computing, we have a diversity of data, social media data, traffic data, uh, geographic data. How to integrate knowledge from multiple data sets? 
this is a new challenge. Third, um, database and the machine learning are used to be two separate communities. Okay? They have their own conference and their own um, community to attend. There is about the overlap between the two sides is very minor, and KDD might be the place that two parts meet together. But in order to deploy real urban computing application, we need to harness the knowledge from both sides, both sides. And we need to organically integrate machine learning algorithm with data management algorithm at the algorithm, at the algorithm level instead of uh, separate them one by one. The fourth challenge is from simple static data mining to visual interactive data analytics. So that's the four challenges on this layer. Um, this is a logic layer, and I will bring you the concrete layer. Uh, I mean, the, the real design of the system. So this is, a, this is a data management layer I just mentioned. On top of that, we have a data analytics layer. Uh, this is a big data platform for urban computing. And also, you can regard it as an urban big data platform. Uh, now this layer is further comprised of three sub-layers. One is some common machine learning algorithm, like regression, classification, uh, or outlier detection. So this is a very general algorithm uh, that is already available in cloud computing platform. But uh, that's not enough. As I said, spatial temporal data is different. So we need to design some dedicated algorithm, dedicated machine learning algorithm for spatial temporal data. And also we have designed cross-domain knowledge fusion algorithm for spatial temporal data. So the two sub layer are new in cloud computing platform. Now let's see what's the difference between spatial temporal data and the other data sets. Okay. Um, spatial temporal data is unique because it has spatial property and temporal property. The spatial property is further comprised of spatial distance and spatial hierarchy. Let's see, uh, typically according to the first law of geography, everything on Earth is related, but near thing is more related than distant thing. I, we can say not our phenomena, uh, in general, it, so it, it, it works. Um, as the distance increase between two locations, the similarity between their reading decrease almost linearly. Uh, this is a uh, first law of geography. But in image data, people might say we also have distance between different pixels. But such kind of dis distance is not that meaningful as compared to the geographic distance. Let me give you one example. So suppose this is a picture that has been taken for one person. Um, let me say, use me as an example. If you take a picture of me at this angle, it is a picture two dimension, a pixel on my face, maybe very close to the pixel on my background, right? On the picture, I mean, if you take a photo of me, on the picture, the pic one pixel on my face is very close to the background on my background. So the, the distance is very close, which is supposed to be very similar, but it's not that similar. On the contrary, another pixel on my right face, which is farther than the distance between the pixel on my left face and the background, but this pixel is more relevant than the background one when we do image segmentation, right? So the distance it's not that meaningful in image data. As you can see this example. P1 and P1 and P2 are very close to each other, but the P1 is a pixel on the background, and P2 is a pixel on the, uh, on the, on the person's face. But the P3 looks very far on the two-dimensional picture space, but it's more relevant than P1, uh, than P2 as compared to P1. So the distance is not very meaningful in other data sets. And also there are some uh, um, triangular inequality. For example, um, this is very widely used. And this triangle inequality can be used to prove many search space. But such kind of triangle inequality does not exist in many other data sets, like text, like images. And also in social network, there's no location for each user. I'm not, I'm not seeing 
uh, I'm not saying location does not have use. I mean, in the graph, in the social network graph, each node is not associated with a location. So you cannot only you can only measure the distance between two users in a graph by one hop or two hop. There's no difference between one hop users. But in geographic space, we know the exact location of each sensor. We know the correlation between them in terms of distance. So that's a spatial distance, which is very unique. Second one is spatial hierarchy. Spatial hierarchy, um, a city is comprised of some uh, district, and the district is further comprised of some neighborhoods. On different layer of the hierarchy, we can obtain different uh, semantic meanings. For example, if we are trying to compute the similarity between a pair of users based on their location history. We assume the more location history they share, the more similar the two users might be. Now we can say two users sharing a location in the same room, or two users share the same location in a building, or share the same location in a city. Different locations have different granularity and representing different Similarity. If we can share location in a room, that means we may, we might have an even closer relationship. So the hierarchy has a very uh, informative, inform uh, informative, uh, more information than other information. But in in pixel in in image data, uh, even if we can merge four pixels into one, there's no semantic meaning between the merge. So that's the right reason why it's different. And from temporal perspective, spatial temporal data has temporal properties. Temporal properties first comprise of three properties here. Temporal closeness. Uh, two adjacent time interval may have a similar traffic pattern. This is very intuitive. And this is very similar to video data. So the two consecutive frames may have very similar representation of data. But Spatial temporal data has a periodical information, which is very different from video data. We can say the traffic pattern repeat every day. This, the, traffic, uh, the traffic data of this morning, for example, the traffic data on Monday, may be very similar to the traffic data in, on Tuesday morning. But the traffic data at 8 a.m. today might be very different from the traffic data at 12 p.m. today. Even if 12 p.m. is only with four time hour distance to a.m. today, but a.m. tomorrow has a 24 time distance between today. But 24 hours has a higher similarity. This is because of the periodic information. This breaks this one. And we never see any video data repeats every five minutes. You never see when you watch a movie, you never see the similar scene across every, or every few seconds or minutes. So this is different. And also the, the pure information is not static. It, it's, there's some trend in the pure information. For example, when the temperature is getting colder and colder, people get up later and later. Then the morning rush hour comes later and later. So there's a rising trend or a decreasing trend in the spatial temporal data. How to model the temporal closeness, the period information and the trend information is very important. If we cannot model them, we just treat them as a similar, as a, as a text data or image data, then our performance, uh, the performance of our model may not be that good. So this is a, why spatial temporal data is different. I will give you more concrete example later. And second, is how to field knowledge across different domains. There's another tutorial, and I will give you more example on this part. Um, this is a survey paper on attribute transaction on big data. I think there, there, there are something new in big data, which is not because of the data is big. It's because of the data is heterogeneous and from different domains. And how to field knowledge from different domains is a challenge. And here I summarize the methodology to field the knowledge from different domains into three categories. The first one is called stage-based data fusion, um, which is very simple. That means we can use a one type of data first, and then second type of data later, step by step. 
Okay, this is very straightforward. Or we can throw different type of data into different type of model, and then we aggregate the results generated by different model, and then generate one results, final results. This is called stage-based one. But there's no feedback. And this is a straightforward, no, no go back, okay? Um, the second type of measure is called feature-based data filter, which is further comprised of two subcategories. One is called feature concatenation plus some regularization. Another one is called deep learning based. And this one is getting popular, but it's only one type of data filter matter. Okay. Now, let me give you one, two examples on this part of um, data filter. Here, uh, I used one example about ranking real estates. People usually want to buy some uh, real estates with high value rather than high price. Uh, here, I'm not going to predict the price of a real estate because the price is really hard to predict, even particularly in China. It's, it's almost unpredictable, unpredictable. So I'm not going to predict the price because it's really hard. But we can predict the ranking of real estate, the relative ranking. I mean, given the same market, if it's a rising market, which real estate increase faster than other one, and its price decrease Slow, slower than others. Such kind of relative ranking, we can, we can do that. For more specifically, suppose this is an increase of a real estate over the past one year. We calculate the increase ratio. For example, the original price is uh, uh, 1,000, now it's 2,000. So increase ratio is 2,000 minus 1,000 divided by 1,000. It's 100% increase. Then we can rank the real estates according to their increasing ratio. And further, we can uh, discretize the increasing ratio into five categories. Let's say the category one is with the highest increasing ratio and the decrease, the slowest decreasing ratio. I mean, the best real estates. And the five category, the fifth category is the worst real estates with the slowest increasing ratio and the highest dropping ratio. So, this figure shows a uh, uh, rank one real estate in, in Beijing according to the data in 2013. And this is, figure shows a uh, uh, real estate of rank five, I mean the worst in Beijing according to data in 2013. So this is out of your imagination. You might think all the high quality real estate might, located, might be located in downtown area, but this is not true. You can see um, the location of the Rank one real estate and the rank five real estate may be very close to each other. Why? What's what determines the value of the of a real estate? So I heard there was an old saying say the value of a real estate is determined by three factors. The first one is location, the second one is location, the third one is location. So how to quantify the location? We can quantify the location based on big data. So the first location actually is the geographic utility of, of, the, of the real estate. We can quantify them by point of interest data around the real estate and, the, um, and also the uh, transportation data around it, this place. We can see how many restaurants around this place and the, the number of uh, shopping malls, number of movie theaters, number of ho hospitals, or number of um, uh, high schools around this place. And how many bus stops around this place and where is the closest subway station to this real estate. All this information can be obtained from real network data, point of which data. So this is, this is called geographic utility, the first location. But we know that those data sets are static. A primary school with high quality might increase the value of a real estate tremendously than normal primary school. Uh, this is almost true in, in many countries, okay? And, and a high quality shopping mall may increase the value of a real estate tremendously than a poor or very bad shopping malls. So we need to further differentiate the second location we call the neighborhood popularity. The neighborhood popularity can be quantified by other type of data sets. For example, the social media comments, uh, whether users' comments are positive or negative on this location. And what's, a, what's people's sentiment analysis on a, a school or primary school? 
And also in terms of location or users' um, commuting pattern or uh, moving, movement behavior, we can differentiate between two locations, uh, the value of two locations. Let me give you one example. There are two, there are two locations. People taking different uh, commuting patterns. In one location, people usually um, departing from the location by uh, bars or subway in, in the morning and get back to this location uh, in the, during the evening around 7 or, p 7 or 8 p.m. by the same transportation mode like bus or subway station, subway. But in another location, another area, people departing from the area um, flexibly uh, taking taxi or driving and then return to this place or more, or very flexibly. So which one has a high value you can imagine in terms of people's commuting pattern? Typically, I think this one has a high value because people have a more flexibility to, to, to determine their routing, to determine their um, commuting pattern. And this area, people have to get up early to work and swipe, even swipe a car and then get back home. So people's commuting pattern and, and movement behavior tells the value of this location. So this can be quantified by the taxi data we received by the car swiping data in subway system and the bus system. And the data does not tell line, that don't line, they tell me the truth. So this is the second location. The third location is a business zone where this real estate is located. If this real estate is located in a prosperous zone, the value will be promoted because of the zone. But not every real estate in a good zone will have a very high value. We still need to look at the two issues. So there are many type of data. We have POI data, we have road network data, we have uh, cost swiping data in bars and the subway system. We have social media data. Now we can extract a lot of features from each type of data. For example, the distance to its closest uh, subway system, or the distance to its closest uh, bus stop, or within one kilometer, how many, the number of bus stops. Those can be used as a feature uh, extracted from data. Now, a simple methodology is to concatenate the feature from extracted from different data sets and do a linear regression. Uh, this is a typical way people do, where omega is a parameter, x is a feature vector we will extract from the data, and the Imstrom is a virus uh, that we can learn. And the f is the increasing ratio, for example, 30% increase of the real estate. So people usually do it this way. This is not very good, and I don't think this is called a uh, knowledge fusion, because it's straightforward and too, uh, sometimes you can say too naive. Um, but why this is not working well? Because uh, there are some dependency and the redundancy in the feature. Um, for example, the structure of the network will depend will, will, or the traffic pattern in a region will depends on depends on uh, the structure of the network. So there are dependency between the feature you extract from the network data and the feature you extract from the taxi data or traffic data. And some data, some feature may be redundant. So we add two constraint to the regression model. Why is called pairwise constraint, and second why is called a sparsity regularization. Without without the two constraints, we cannot say this is a feature, a future, a knowledge future model. Uh, it's just a simple linear regression. But with the two constraints, we can achieve a much better performance. Let me elaborate on the two constraints. So the pairwise constraint it means. Um, we do not only require each individual prediction accurate, we also try to keep the order between two, a pair of, a pair of real estate. If the value of uh, real estate i is bigger than real estate h, so i and h are two real estates, its order should be preserved by the model. So more specifically, we use, uh, more specifically, we uh, use uh, the difference between two, a pair of real estate prediction and apply a sigmoid function to transfer the difference into a value between one and zero. And then we use this equation, uh, this value to approximate the probability of the ranking. Let's say if I is truly ranked before real estate edge, 
the prediction fi should be higher than fh. Then fi minus fh should be greater than zero. Then after the transformation, the sigmoid function will generate a value close to one. This can be regarded as a, um, a reward for a correct uh, uh, prediction. Um, otherwise, if i is ranked before h, but the prediction of i, fi, is smaller than fh, then fi minus fh is smaller than zero, then sigmoid function will generate a, a value close to zero. This can be regarded as a punishment for an incorrect prediction. So this is called a pairwise ranking constraint. And for the uh, sparsity regularization, as I just mentioned, many, many features are redundant. And, and there are some independence between them. So we hope the redundant feature does not really functional. Uh, it's not functional in the uh, equation. So we enforce a sparsity constraint on the omega, I mean the parameter of the, of the, um, of the features. So we enforce such kind of uh, constraint. Uh, we enforce the omega to follow a distribution, Gaussian distribution, with a mean zero and a very small standard deviation. In this case, most omega will fall around zero. But we still allow some omega can cho to choose a higher value, a big value, with a small probability, like, like the primary school or a uh, high quality shopping mall. Some feature may be very useful but many features may be redundant. So many features will fall around zero, and a very, a very few features can choose a high value with a very small probability. So this is called sparsity regularization. The reason why we, we cannot use some L1, L2 minimization, if you simply use L1, L2, we try to minimize every parameters. But here we try to differentiate the width of different parameters. Some width, some parameters may be very important, then we can give them a higher width. Now how to evaluate the performance? Uh, this is very simple. We can trim the model based on the data generated in 2013 and 14, and we try to predict the ranking of real estate in 2015. Once 2015 has gone, we can get the data, and then we can rank the real estate and have the ground truth of the ranking. Then we can measure our prediction against the ground truth and then see if our ranking is accurate or not by using NDCG, okay? So the NDCG at 3 the file is, uh, is beyond uh, 0 0.9, so it's very accurate. And, and this model can be widely used uh, um, business location choosing uh, for many applications, not only for, for the real estate. You can imagine you can use this for select location for shopping mall or for uh, a business you want to start up. So this is uh, a general learning to rank model for business choosing, location choosing. I think it's time for COVID break, right? Not yet? Okay, we have, okay, we still have time, okay? Okay, so, <laughs> wow. So now, let me go, go through. Let me finish this one. And the talk is getting more and more interesting later. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so now, as I said, there are two subcategories in this uh, feature-based knowledge fusion. One is called uh, feature concatenation plus some regularization. I just used a real estate example to demonstrate that kind of methodology. Now, the second subcategory is using deep learning-based one, which is very hot recently years. Um, here, we're trying, to, we're trying to predict the inflow and outflow of each and every region throughout the entire city. Uh, suppose we divide the city into uniform grids, then we can predict the number of uh, people step into our region and the number of people departing from a region in over the next couple of hours. So this is a very general model. Uh, you can imagine this can be used for public safety. Uh, if there's a region with many people step into the area in the next couple of hours, then this might be risky for public safety. And if you can predict uh, the number of flow in your location, then we can do a better logistic industry for 
dispatching for um, uh, arrangement. So I show you one real system we deploy in Guiyang. Uh, here we partition the city into one kilometer by, by one kilometer square grids, and we can predict the number of uh, taxi entering each grid and the departing of each grid over the next uh, couple of hours. So I just use driving to use the uh, uh, test gap data as an example to demonstrate the capability of the platform. I'm not saying test gap data can represent the flow of cars. So if you give me cell phone data, I can predict the number of people uh, carrying a cell phone, moving to a place and departing from a place. If you give me a, a ride sharing data, I can predict the number of people riding a bike, um, entering into a place and departing from a place. If you give me a car swiping data in a subway system, I can predict the number of people step into a subway station and number of people departing from a subway station. So this model is very, very general and it can be used for many, many predictions. So there are two types of application for this model. One for public safety and another one is for logistic industry. Uh, Intelligence together. So, uh, this problem is very challenging because of three reasons. The first one, as we know, urban flow depends on many complex factors. For example, the flow of previous time interval, or the flow of these neighborhoods. I mean, the flow of a region, the flow of a region may depend on the flow in its past hours or the flow of its special neighborhoods. And sometimes we need to consider the flow from a region that is far from the location we're going to predict. Because when there are major events happening, people may take a subway through the underground and reach destination without passing its neighborhood regions. So that means in order to accurately predict the flow of crowds in a region, you almost need to consider the flow from all other regions. This makes this problem very complex and very difficult to predict. And also we know weather condition and events will affect the flow of cars tremendously. If we cannot predict such kind of situation, the prediction model is almost useful, uh, useless because the regular pattern, every people knows the regular pattern. You don't need to predict it. Okay. And also I just say, as I said, there are spatial temporal property we need to model. For example, the temporal closeness, temporal periodic information and trend information, spatial distance, and spatial hierarchy. How to capture all this information in the deep learning model? This is very challenging. It's not simply grab some CNN or grab some air stamp to apply this problem because they cannot capture the spatial temporal property very well. Let me see. Let's see how we work it out. Um, we partition the city by uniform grids. Uh, we project the trajectory data we received in the past time interval and project them onto the grids. Then we can count the number of inflow and number of outflow in each grid. Uh, um, just like a picture with RGB in each pixel, we have three values, but here we only have two values, in and out. So we can formulate a matrix. Okay? Supposing we, we only visualize the inflow uh, with a two-dimensional picture, so uh, the lighter the displays, the more people entering this place. Now, if we have multiple data of multiple frames, we can receive uh, data like a like video frame, okay. And also we have the, the weather condition and the events information associated with each time frame. This is the input of data, and the output is how the next frame looks like. This is a frame of the prediction. Now we can apply deep learning model. I'm not sure, I should not say apply, we should design a dedicated deep learning model for this problem. Okay, first, we threw the recent few frames into a deep convolutional, deep residual convolutional uh, neural network to model the temporal closeness of traffic across recent time frame. This is a temporal closeness. I mean, the traffic condition at the, at the Jensen time uh, intervals should be similar. 
This is the model, the temporal closeness. And also we can through the frame of the same time of yesterday, the same time of, of the day before yesterday, or even the same time the day before last week, into the same deep residual convolutional uh, network to model the pure information. And also we can through even farther uh, time frame, like uh, 2 p.m. of la last week, the 2 p.m. of last month, the same day of 2 p.m. of last month into the, uh, the same structure of model to model the trend information. Then we can throw the rest of, we can skip the rest of frames. We only use this about a couple of a frame as input to model the temporal closeness, temporal uh, pure information, temporal trend information. Then we fuse the output of the stream model. Um, then further we apply um, the external factor like weather condition events to the entire city and uh, merge the prediction of the two sides together to generate the final prediction. So I want to emphasize, first, this is a collective prediction. We predict, we predict the inflow and outflow of each and every grid collectively and simultaneously. We don't do prediction individually because they are correlated. You have to do prediction together. So deep learning can solve this problem very well. Second, how to model the spatial correlation? The three components model the temporal property and how the spatial correlation are modeled in each component. Here, we use a deep convolutional neural network to capture the spatial correlation of near distance and the farther distance. We know when we do one layer of CNN, we capture the spatial correlation of near distance. But if you keep on doing convolutional operation, we actually aggregate the information of farther distance. The reason why we need to consider the information of farther distance is because when some major events happen, people will come from regions that is far from the destination or from the location we're going to predict. But we know when the layer of CNN becomes deeper and deeper, the training performance decreases. Now we use a residual network to tackle these challenges. And third, there's a fusion model. When we fuse in the three components, we have a parameter, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, for each of them. And different locations, different grids have different omegas. It's not one third plus one third plus one third. They're different location. They have different width. Let me give you some simple example. In some location, we may have some uh, strong trend information, but in some location, we will have very very weak, pure, pure information. Huh. Let me visualize the, uh, the omega. So if we visualize the omega separately, um, here is a visualization of omega one throughout the entire city. Each grid has a one omega one. Uh, the darker the, the grid, the bigger the width of omega one, this grid heights, okay? You can see here, we observe very light grids. That means the omega here is very small, which means the temporal closeness information is not very obvious in this location. This location are ring road, the first ring road of Beijing. Because on ring road, you might experience such kind of situation. At a, the, at a, at a, uh, one hour before, it's not clouded at, at all. But suddenly, it gets congestion, congested. Because in some major road, there are not a lot uh, street, of small streets will merging into this uh, major roads, changing the traffic tremendously in a very short period. So the temple closeness period is not that obvious. Uh, in another example, if we visualize the omega-2 corresponding to the pure information, we can see here we observe a very strong pure property for this location. This is actually a park, a Chaoyang Park. It's a, so there's a very clear pure information. People go to park on weekends. So there's strong pure information. But on some, in some locations, the pure information is not very clear. So this is a hospital because you don't know when you go to hospital. So there's no pure information. Or more say, the pure information is very weak in this location, such location. 
And also, in some location, we observe very, very weak trend information. This is Zhongguan Chong area. This is a, a working space for many companies. So you have to go to go to work, no matter it's it's cold or hot. So the trend information is not not clear. But in another place, the trend information is very clear. This is Zoom in Beijing. As we know, when temperature getting warmer and warmer, more and more people go to Zoom. And when get, getting colder and colder, a few people go to, go to Zoom. So trend information is very clear. So in this example, we use deep learning to predict the inflow and outflow of each and every grids simultaneously by using a very specific uh, model we designed. So why not use simple CN or why not use a simple LSTM? So if we use LT LSTM, okay, let's say, if you're trying to use LSTM to model, to predict the flow, okay, the input of data has to be very long. If the data, if, if your input only have a few uh, couple of hours, the data itself does not contain pure, pure information and the trend information, then how the model can learn the pure information, the trend information. But if you try to through three months data, which incorporate pure information and trend information into the air step, supposing one frame, uh, one hour per frame, then three months data may have over 2,000 frames as an input. This makes the air step model intractable and very hard to train, and the performance decrease. We compare our method with the LSTM. You cannot do it that way, okay? And LSTM does not consider the spatial correlation of location. You, you switch the data into a vector through them into LSTM. So that's the reason why we not use LSTM. Why not just use CNN? You can say CNN only captures spatial correlation, does not uh, temporal correlation. But why not uh, CNN LSTM? There's no new model, so it's called a kind of CNN LSTM. But CNN LSTM, you cannot capture the spatial correlation of a farther distance. You can, you can use LSM combined with CNN to capture short period of correlation or small distance correlation. But as I just mentioned, there might be some people from very far distance to reach the location we're going to predict. We have to do CNN multiple times to capture the spatial correlation of farther distance. And you have to reduce some residual network structure to do that. So that's the reason why we not use LSTM, why we not use CN, or why we not use CN plus LSTM simply. But here we have this structure, and, and, and we choose very high accuracy. We compare with almost all deep learning models, and this is why it's best. Okay. And then we have released the data on my homepage and the code on my homepage, so you can use this for free. Now, we are not satisfied. We're trying to further explore um, we predict um, not only the total flow of people in and out region, but also where does where do these people come from, come from, and where do people live for. So that's the transition between them. This becomes even more challenging. So which means we can predict the transition between any two locations in the city over the, over the next couple of hours. So this is a very very challenging task because as we see. Um, previously, if we only predict the inflow and outflow of the entire city, supposing there are n location, the complexity is O n. But now, if we are trying to predict the transition between them, the complexity O n square, right? And the transition between each pair of location may be very sparse. In some locations, there may be no transition. So how to predict them is a very, very challenging topic. So if we want to know how we solve this problem, Probably we can have a coffee break first. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the time, okay? Okay, let's get back. Uh, I think the time is not right. <laughs> let's take a 20 minutes break anyway, okay? <laughs>